to ARC again for this week. Let's go straight to prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless you, Lord, for the freedom we have to meet together around your word, for the freedom we have to know you and to be sanctified, to be transformed a little by little and a day by day, Lord, so that we might ever be closer to reflecting you for the sake of those especially, Lord, who don't know you. We pray and ask, Lord, that you'd give us your spirit, that you'd work your spirit in us, on us, and concerning us and through us for the good of our neighbour, Lord, as we've been learning about love and the necessity to love our neighbour in reflection of your love for us, even to love ourselves in reflection of your love for us. With all this in mind, Lord, as we turn to your word, we pray and ask that you'd pierce every hard heart, that you'd soften every stiff neck, that you'd take the scales from the eyes of the blind, that you'd call those who are a bit slow, Lord, to become wise, and that you would take, Lord, the weak and foolish things of the world, which we are, and make us a testimony for you, that you wouldn't leave anyone behind who could have been saved, that you spare nothing, Lord to rescue, to glean your fields right to the edges, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So firstly, you'll notice that you got two handouts. So this one, with no picture on it, we're not doing tonight, this is just for your, a keeper for you. This was a request during the week about what's the deal with rosaries. So it was a really random topic to me, right? So, but I had so much feedback even from overseas. Have you, oh, you might not have one, Ariel, let's here. Thank you. So I had so much feedback that people really liked it and said it was really helpful and useful, so I just printed you one. So if you haven't already read that, that one is not for tonight, that's just to take it home and read it. It's super simple, and um, it will help you to understand the rights and the wrongs from a scriptural point of view, and if you're a Catholic and you're reading it, remember it's not about being anti-Catholic. No one here is anti-Catholic. We are pro-Jesus. We want everyone to be saved. So if something is not helpful for, you to, for your salvation, then it's better that you dump it. And that's the case with the rosary. Right? It's very unhelpful for your salvation. So feel free to throw it out. Now... Let's begin. Our topic tonight is about having right expectations. If someone ends up shocked or in a panic about anything, what can you say about their preparedness beforehand about that? I'll give you an example. So like when we're doing public displays, you know, some of you guys have seen it. Sometimes we'll bring our big artillery gun out and it's very loud, right? When we fire it, it's very loud, shakes the ground. So when we fire it, none of our guys even blink. But the crowd always just about has a coronary and jumps in the air, right? What's the difference? We know what to expect. So when it happens, we are not moved. We are prepared. We know what to expect. So when it happens, none of us jump, right? Because what we're expecting is what happens and so it's no big deal. That principle applies to what Jesus tells us about what will happen in the last days. So our topic tonight is about having the right kind of expectations so that when things happen, you are not melting down, freaking out, and thinking the world is ending, even though, in fact, the world is ending. You know, you're able to stand. You're not overwhelmed. Your emotions are not overwhelmed. Your mind is not overwhelmed. Because you go, okay, this is just what Jesus said would happen. So I won't be moved. I won't be shaken by it. Whereas those who would refuse to listen, they will be devastated by the very same things. So let's, just to get ourselves started, let's look at the cover page. And this one, let's make sure we're on the right 
handout. And let's just read that out loud together. It's very short from James 5. Let's just read that out together. James 5 verse 7, if you're watching from somewhere else. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. I'll just pause there for a second. In, in the Middle East, it only really rains consistently twice a year. So in the spring, and then again in the autumn. So agriculturally, you get two big harvests, one at the springtime and a second big harvest in the autumn. That's what this mention of the autumn and the spring rains is about. Because remember everything that God says to the Jewish people, he puts into agricultural terms that they can understand. He talks to them in farmer talk, because farmer talk is what? They, it's their normal language, right, that they understand. So he says, the farmer patiently waits for those rains which are going to bring him the harvest. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. And the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. What does persevere mean? Anyone? What does persevere mean? Don't quit. So those who have persevered as those who have not quit, they have not turned back, they have not turned aside to something else. They put their head down and keep going. You have heard of, of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. What happened to Job at the end? It says here, you have seen what happened to Job. What is that? What is the what finally happened? Do all we know who we mean by Job? What happened to Job in the end? How does his story finish? Just restored. So I'm not sure if the ah, that's it. So even though his terrible experience of trial, he lost everything. So he it would seem that to stay loyal cost him everything but because he wouldn't turn back because he persevered the Lord did not only give him back what he lost but abundantly more than he ever had at the beginning or that he would have had if he had not gone through that experience in modern speak we would say that losing everything turned out to be profitable for Job so that's what the writer is saying that's what James is saying you might think that your your walk with Jesus is costing you an insane amount and the temptation to like just turn back and be like the world and run after the world's things what's God's message to us it doesn't matter what it costs you those who persevere will inherit not just the replacement of what they lost but abundantly more, more than you could ever have gained in this life. And we're not just talking about money, we're not just talking about houses or cars, we're talking about being in paradise when everyone else is in the lake of fire. And I don't know about you, but that seems like a fairly profitable outcome compared to those who were not content to put up with things and press on to be as the disciples. Perseverance, patience in the midst of trial. So keep that in your background as like the big picture frame around our topic. We turn now to the actual message. So I've been told that the right fruit and the right expectations, the right fruit and the right expectations. So this came about because I asked the Lord for a word in season. So, does it, can anyone tell me what a word in season means? It's a, it's, a, it's a Christian term that you don't hear very much anymore, but what is a word in season? It's a word that's applicable to you 
for to a person at a certain point in time. At a certain point in time, that's right. So I could teach any topic from any place in the Bible randomly, and it's all a word, right? But a word in season is asking the Lord out of all the scripture, out of all the million choices that we could talk about, which is the bit that we need to know in the season that we're in. So I asked the Lord for a word in season and tonight's topic is the response. So please tune in because I trust him that he, that he always answers prayer. So I absolutely believe that we are supposed to understand this topic right now for what is coming. We're going to use this as our basic scripture. We're going to use Matthew 24. Matthew 24, we'll start in verse 3. So, as he, that's Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when all these things will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, in modern speak, it would be the disciples asking Jesus, exactly when is the end times? When is the kingdom coming? When will you return and establish the kingdom? That's essentially what they're saying. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumours of wars. See to it you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name <clears throat> at that time many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness increased, most people's love will grow cold, most. The Greek word there is quite specific. So it's not a couple of people will fall away. It's most of the church will fall away. But the one who endures to the end, remember the scripture we just read at the beginning? The one who perseveres to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. And then the end will come. So we're going to look at that blow by blow to understand what God is saying to us and what our right expectation should be so that when things happen, we are not shaken. That we are prepared because we're expecting what he told us to expect. So if they happen, you don't think, oh, oh, what's happened? Where's God? Has God dropped the ball? How could this be happening? Instead, your faith is strengthened because you understand that all the 2,000 years ago, Jesus told us specifically, this is what will happen at the end. So I just need to put a caveat on it. I'm not saying that this is definitely the end of, right? So I'm saying if. Because as I repeat a million times, no one knows the hour or the day of his coming. Right? But he said to watch for the signs. And the signs are certainly with us. So either, there's only two options. I'll say this much is absolutely true. Either this is the beginning of the end, what's happening in our world around us, or it's a very good dress rehearsal. And God does do that throughout history. He runs like dress rehearsals that come almost but not quite. Something will be missing. The difference this time is that the Jews are back in the land. There's a threat of the third temple being built. And the Temple Institute say they can build it in just three years. Everything else they need for the temple they've already made, sitting in a warehouse in Jerusalem. Right? 
So never before in history have all the other things that have to be in place in Israel for the prophecies to be fulfilled. They've never been there because the Jews were not back in the land. But once the Jewish people came back in 1948 when Israel became an independent Jewish state, from that moment on, the second coming becomes scripturally possible. Because remember, there has to be Jews in Jerusalem, there has to be a temple that, Je that Jesus re-enters and is greeted by those that Jewish remnant when he returns. So you have to have Jews in Jerusalem with a temple. So it's not going to happen next week, in case you're wondering, because there's no temple, right? Not yet. But, as I said, they have got the plans. All they need is the courage or the insanity, whatever way you look at it, to bulldoze the al Mosque and the Dome of the Rock and rebuild the Jewish temple on the site of the original. Right? You imagine, now can you imagine the chaos and the war that would break out if they bulldozed. So the t if the temple gets rebuilt, that all fits in with why the world descends into chaos when the whole Islamic world will gather to try and punish them for bulldozing that mosque. Can anyone say anything interesting for anyone Islamic worrying about that mosque in Jerusalem? How often did Muhammad visit Jerusalem? I'll give you a clue. It's a very easy number to count. Zero. <laughs> Alan guessed it. Muhammad never, ever in his whole life went to Jerusalem, except in a dream. So the entire claim of Islam to Jerusalem is based on a dream in which he went in a dream to Jerusalem, but he never physically went there, ever, you know. But that won't stop them trying to kill every Jew in sight if, those, if that part of the Jewish people, because most, I don't know if you know this, but most Israelis are secular. The vast majority of Israelis have no religion at all, not even Jewish. You know, they're Jewish by culture, but they don't practice any religion. But there's a very strong ultra-religious part that wants to rebuild the temple. And sooner or later, for the, to fulfill scripture, they will prevail. You know? Chaos will result. So it's not next week. It's not next year. But it could be in your lifetime, quite easily. Let's look and see at these things. So we need to understand that our topic fits into what we did the last couple of weeks. So remember the last couple of weeks we've been looking at the command to love ourselves and that our love for ourselves should be the reflection of God's love for us and our love for our neighbour needs to be the same. So you shouldn't have one way of loving some people and a different way of loving others. There should just be one measure, one style. Remember, and you learn it in that priority relationship. How he loves me is how I must love myself in reflection of that. Just a quick refresher. Can anyone give me a couple of aspects of that that you can apply very practically. So in loving myself, what's a couple of practical things that I need to be strict with myself about my loving myself to be in agreement with God? I hope you know because you need to be practicing it. Give me a couple of practical things. When should I start? What's that there? Yeah. Now. That's right. How long did God wait before loving me? <coughs> he didn't. Did he wait till I got to a certain level of goodness before he says, oh, okay, that's close, I'll love him now? No, remember? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That was the measure of his love, right? So that's the rule for me. 
you know. What else? Who should I compare myself to to see whether I'm lovable? Maybe he's got the right answer. What is it? How many? Who? No one. Why? Because of all have sinned. All have fallen short. No one has any cause to boast. If anyone has a big ego next to you, they are in a delusion. But in any objective sense, they are no better, they have no better right to boast, actually, than you. So you're never less than anybody. So you can own being a sinner in need of salvation as a, the great leveler, you know? That's why we can love our enemies, because you know what? Your enemy is you without Christ. People who act in an ungodly way are just acting human. And that would be you, but for the grace of God. So we can be merciful and compassionate, understanding that before Christ came and made himself known to you, you are that person. And you have treated other people exactly like they're treating you, right? It's the great leveler. So there's other things, but Go back over the notes if you haven't understood it yet. It's so important and it will get more important when these things happen. It becomes very important to be able to actually practice loving yourself in agreement with him and loving others in agreement with him, some of whom will be treating you really badly. Really badly. Let's look at the list though. Let's look at some of the things he says to watch out for. Wars and rumours of wars. So what can we say about most of you are under 30 probably? So in your lifetime, what can you say about war in the world? Is it tracking down or tracking up in terms of frequency and scale? Up, right? So there's probably not been many years of your life that there wasn't a war going on somewhere. Even in the Middle East, right, there's almost never been a day of peace probably in your lifetime. Right? The 20th century was the most violent century in history. And this century is looking worse. The British Army, anyone care to Anyone care to guess how many days the British Army was not fighting, like actually firing weapons, the whole of the 20th century? How many days was the British Army not shooting at someone? One. In 1960 something. A single day in the entire century that the British Army was not involved in an actual war somewhere. Sorry about the noise upstairs. What's the scripture say? Some said it thundered, but it wasn't. It was just kids running around. So a very violent century, but this century is already barely, it's barely got going. It's only the third year and it's been constant war. But the frequency and intensity of war is going up. What have you got at the moment? Ukraine, Syria, Iran, you've got the Sudan, the Chinese are openly threatening to invade Taiwan, which will bring the Philippines, Japan, Australia and the UK and the US into combat with China. You've got nuclear armed crazy people like the North Koreans rattling their saber and demanding things or else, you know, and because He's a fruit loop. You can't guarantee he won't accidentally fire one. And if he fires one, for sure someone will fire back. That's how these things happen. So we know that we can tick that box about our time to say that wars and rumours of war, for sure that's a feature 
of the season that we find ourselves in. So you can put a giant tick there. Tick. What about nations riding, rising against nation? So remember, the original is in Greek, right? So in Greek, it obviously doesn't say nation. That's an English word. It says ethnon. It's actually ethnon against ethnon. And ethnon is the word, the Greek word from which you get our English word ethnicity. So nations here is not talking about nation states. It's not talking about China versus the USA. It's talking about ethnicities coming into conflict. So what's happening in our world at the moment? Well, in my whole, I'm 60, right? I've never in my entire life seen so much global ethnic division. And it's getting wider and wider, like the, even in our own country, the division between Maori and non-Maori has never been so wide as now. In the US, the Black Lives Matter thing has split society. There's never been such a division between ethnic groups, and it's global. It's global. Even the Ukraine-Russia war, you know, wasn't very long ago that they were all Soviets. But now, oh no, even though they all speak basically the same language, now <coughs> Ukrainian and Russian cannot even imagine that they are related. In case you're wondering, the Ukrainians are actually closer to Polish. The Ukraine was part of the Polish Empire for most of its history, but they speak Ukrainian is basically the same as Russian. Right? So everywhere at the moment, ethnic division is a huge, huge feature, and it's been driven by not just old-fashioned conflict, it's been also driven by the ideology of the whole woke thing, you know, and fighting for ethnic rights. They think they're doing a good thing, but look at the results. So in fighting for the rights of Maori, they've actually made more people suspicious of Maori than ever before. It's all backfiring, you know, and now there's like I have friends that would never hear a bad thing to say about Mary, and now if anything about Mary rights comes on the TV, they just go and turn the TV off. There's zero tolerance. You know? That's a, so that's a massive backfire, a massive fail. And I just hope it doesn't end up with like actual conflict. Right? So we can put a giant tick about that in the times that we live in, you can tick that box as well. <coughs> Why, remember what I just said, that we need those, those skills about loving ourselves and our neighbour more. The one we just talked about, ethnic division. <coughs> for the Christians caught in the middle of it, what does the commandment remain for us? You must love your neighbour as yourself. Does it make any difference what ethnicity your neighbour is? There's no like special clause, right? Your neighbour is your neighbour. The human being adjacent to you in any situation. And there's how many standards are there? Well, just the one, as myself, as God loves me. This means the Christians will find themselves in no man's land because we won't be allowed to take sides. And then when you stand in Christ, you will realise that both sides are as mad as each other. You know, you, you will not take the Black Lives Matter side and you won't take the white supremacist side because you'll realise you'll realize that both sides are equally unhinged, glaring at each other and ready to rip each other's throats out, right? We have to live in the middle and love them both. You don't have to like them. And when we did that, God's not asking us to like them. You have to agape them. It means tell them the truth, call them to repentance. Keep setting a better example, all those things that agape really is. 
Hence, learn that skill. Learn how God loves you and then love yourself the same way and then make that the way you love everyone in the room, regardless who they are, because your need for that skill is only going to go up. Even in your workplace, you're going to eventually have other staff who are on opposite sides of these divides. And they will get heated and you'll be in the same room. You'll be God's witness in the room. So you have to have that ability to be impartial. You know, not take sides. Well, you do take sides, you take God's side. You know, so you're both wrong. You're both out of order. You know? Will they appreciate you? No. <laughs> but that's what we're called to do. We're, we're called to be the same voice in the room. We're called to be the solid ground in the room when everyone else is throwing rocks at each other from the quicksand. Because these things are going to happen, and in fact, are already happening. I'm not going to do every single one blow by blow, because this is just to give you the idea, right? So the next one I jump to is famines and earthquakes. So statistically, let's start with earthquakes. You'll watch the news. We all have our phones now, so if there's an earthquake anywhere on the planet, right, you hear about it. Do you think earthquakes are getting more common? Okay, so the answer is no. I have a geology degree, right? So globally, the number of earthquakes remains about the same as usual. But why you think they're getting more common is that most earthquakes are too small to get reported. What's happening is though there aren't more earthquakes, the earthquakes that are happening are getting more intense. So we're getting more catastrophic earthquakes than before. More that are over like six on the scale. Because under six you don't usually get severe damage. Over six you, you're starting to look at loss of life and things like that. <coughs> So here's a little pop quiz for you. Out of all the natural disasters, what kind of throw me some natural disasters, not man-made ones, nature killing people or hurting people. So we mentioned earthquakes, what else have you got? Tsunami. Floods, tsunamis, Tornado. tornadoes, typhoons, <coughs> hurricanes. hurricanes, typhoons, yeah, landslides, avalanches. That's most of them, right? Lightning strikes. Lightning. That's right. Interesting fact, nothing to do with your salvation, but you know they say lightning never strikes the same place twice? Wrong. R lightning regularly strikes the same place twice. One of my professors had to go to Africa to find out why this tribe had this appalling um, death rate from lightning strikes in their village. And he's driving in the Land Rover with the guide across the desert toward this village. And they had like 20, 30 people a year killed by lightning in the, in the village. Just hit, boof. Right? And the whole countryside is dead flat desert. You know, imagine Africa, right? Dead flat. And then suddenly in the distance, he sees these hills sticking straight up like a, like a castle. Big massive rocks sticking straight up and they're flat at the top and the village is on top. Right? And he said, that wouldn't be the village, would it? And the guy's like, oh, how did you know that? And he's like, because the rocks are red. Does anyone guess what red rocks usually indicates? Sorry. Iron. There's ironstone. So if you have a big flat area and then you have something tall and skinny sticking up made of iron, what do we normally call that? A lightning rod. And where did they put their village? On the top of it. That meant that if there was lightning coming down anywhere within about 30 miles, it would be attracted and diverted to the top of that rock where the village was. So he just got them to move off it and nobody else died. But yes, in fact, Lightning hits the same place twice or three times or ten times pretty regularly. 
How do we get onto that? I have no idea. But which do you think is the most dangerous out of all those things? Which do you think kills the most people? Floods, lightning, typhoons, earthquakes. In terms of like danger to humans, which is the one that is the scariest? Floods. Floods? Yeah, I probably would have guessed floods as well, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But the answer, floods kill, uh, the fatality rate attributed to floods is 11% of all the fatalities mm -hmm. in a year. Just 11%. 50% mm -hmm. is earthquakes. Mm -hmm. Far and away, earthquakes are the most dangerous natural event mm -hmm. that happens. Far more people are killed or injured by earthquake than any of those other things. So it's, we can tick the box for earthquakes because even though there's not more of them happening, far more people have been affected, become homeless or injured or killed than before because the number of really severe earthquakes is going up. And we will have one here. Like we're 500 years overdue for the next big one here. So. Yeah, well, we should have had it by now, on average, but earthquakes don't behave neatly on average, so, you know, it could be next week or not, it could be in another 400 years, you know, you just can't tell. But Wellington will have one eventually at some point. I think we had this morning. Yeah, there's been a swarm of earthquakes up in Hawke's Bay, yeah. there's been a whole lot. So, it, the more small earthquakes you have, the better. Yeah, it means the faults are relieving themselves. Mm. It's better that the fault does lots of little slips mm. than if it can't move, if it locks, mm. and the pressure keeps building up, then when it does move, it'll go really violently like that, and that's what the big, really big quakes are. So we can tick the box for earthquakes, that there's an increase in the kind of earthquakes you worry about, not all those little ones. What about famine? So believe it or not, thanks to modern farming, famine is at the lowest it's been for about 200 years, globally. So famine's actually gone down markedly. But what is the problem for modern farming? What does modern farming rely on that you didn't have 200 years ago? Not electricity. Electricity is what they hope we'll switch to. Fossil fuels. The only reason we have the food we have is because artificial fertilizer made mostly from petroleum products and tractors and combine harvesters and big trucks. So, so our mass production farming that makes feeding 10 billion people possible relies on the farming being done on a colossal scale by machines. When we still farmed with horses or, you know, just your two rice paddies at home and you've just got, like, you know, then the amount of rice you could grow that way was just this much. But if you've got a machine, the same land will allow you this much. That's why there's famine's gone down, is because farming has become unbelievably productive and efficient, thanks to diesel burning machines. So between real climate change, because the climate is changing, there are parts of the world that are going to get more dry. They'll become less productive for farming. There are other parts that are okay that will become more prone to flooding and they'll become less productive for farming. At the same time, as all these people that want you to drive an electric car will make it harder and harder and harder even to have fertiliser. Because most farm fertilisers are, are a byproduct of the petroleum industry. No petroleum industry, no fertiliser, means those fields will only produce a fraction of what they produce now. And then if you have to go back 
you don't have your big 300 horsepower tractor anymore with its diesel engine, then your ability to produce the kind of food off that land that you were doing now, that will disappear. So the threat of famine is actually going markedly up thanks to the anti, you know, the whole drive an electric car brigade, the whole climate change thing, is actually more likely to cause famine than to stop it by a significant degree. So I say we could just about tick that, we can't actually tick it now, but you can see that in a very short space of time, we could be ticking that as well. Right. So, when you look at those sorts of physical things, you can see why a lot of people, a lot of people in the church, really, really believe that we're in the last days. Do you notice what Jesus said about these kind of signs? What does he say? You can just flip back to the first page and look at verse 8. He says, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. These are signs of the beginning of the end. They're not signs of the end, but of the beginning of the end. So they, so what we could say, if, if it's really happening, and there's lots of signs to suggest that it could well be really happening, then we are living in the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. Does it get better or worse from the beginning as an experience? Worse. Remember our topic, right expectations? <clears throat> so we need to be prepared for what? We need to be prepared for it to be worse. That's the reality Remember, love delights in the truth and hates evil. If we are going to love our neighbour, we need to be witnesses for the truth. Especially in the church, if you are, have the misfortune to be in a dominionist or NAR church, what do you think they are assuming will happen? Because remember, New Apostolic Reformation or dominionism assumes that the kingdom's already here. You know, they assume that this is already the kingdom and that they are already the king's kids and that they are going to conquer Satan and that the whole world's going to be Christian and all that, right? But if it actually gets worse, what do you think will happen to their faith? Remember what it said? Because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will go cold and most of the church is dominionist or NAR. Why will they give up? <coughs> because their expectations will be shattered. They're expecting the whole world to turn into heaven on earth. Instead, it goes the opposite direction. Do you see the problem? What could our role be then? Because we have to love them, they're our neighbour. You can really understand this topic. And if you find someone who's about to lose their faith because they they had 20 years singing Happy Clappy on a, a daydream that's biblically unsound. And now they're losing their faith because instead of heaven on earth like they're expecting, there's wars and there's famines and there's, you know? What are you going to say to them? Well, if you really love them as you commanded, you can sit them down and you can take them here and say, let's look at what Jesus actually said and see who was right your dominionist pastor or Jesus of Nazareth who has been vindicated by events. It's Jesus. Therefore, forget what your pastor said. Forget what your loopy church said and listen to the Messiah and do what he said in it so that you can be saved, so that you don't go calm. That's the purpose of us understanding these things, it's not just for ourselves. It's not just to encourage each other, but when God puts you near someone who's about to lose their faith because of what's happening, 
that you can pull them onto the solid ground and open your Bible and say, look, is what's happening what he said will happen? Yes, it is. Therefore, everything else he said will happen is going to happen as well, including what? Including his return. Remember what we read, our, our opening from James? That just like Job, persevere to the end. Because even though it feels like everything has been stripped away and like, why am I even bothering to live? Remember how Job was at the end? He cursed the day he was born and wished he could just die. You know? But God, because he didn't actually give up, God ended that time and blessed him more. He had more at the end than he would ever have had if nothing had happened. That's the message that you and I need to be able to give someone in distress who's about to lose their faith. Or maybe he has even given up. Because their church fed them baloney expectations that were never in agreement with God. Ever. And so they've expected something over here and this has happened instead. And they think, what are the kind of things do you think they could say to themselves? It's typically either God's real but he doesn't love me and that's why I'm like this. That's fatal. And a lie. Or worse, they can say the whole thing is a lie and that God doesn't exist and I may as well just join the party and go out with a bang. Either way, they'll perish. And there's, there's somebody that can say, hold your horses there. You know? Let's come back to the solid rock and see what the truth is. Does this make sense? I really hope so. Let's look further. In the same scripture, Matthew 24, verse 25, but also Mark 13, verse 23, in that next box there in the red, he says, be on your guard, so that's me, stay alert. I have told you everything ahead of time. Jesus says, I've told you everything ahead of time. He says in the same scripture we just read, these things must take place. Put those two together. What's he saying to you about all these terrible things? I'm warning you now. Why? Remember what I said about firing the artillery gun? Because we all know what's going to happen. When it goes off, we don't jump. Because what happens is what we're expecting. It's Jesus saying the same thing. I'm telling you now so that when these things happen, you are not shaken. On the contrary, you'll say, this is my Lord being vindicated, proved right. When what he said must happen, happens. Instead of being disillusioned, your faith is strengthened because you understand, it's probably an unfair question, but put your hand will speak out of you if you understand what that would mean. Even though it seems evil, even though it's calamity and disaster and like as if Satan can do what he likes. But it's exactly what God says must happen. What does that tell you about who's in charge? Whose will is being done? Satan's? No, God's. Satan is the agent God uses. But it's God's will. It's God's plan. That's why Jesus says, this is part of your salvation. This is part of my salvation for man. This is part of me building to where I'll deal with the wicked. Where I'll separate out my own. And I'll deal with the wicked. And even though it's uncomfortable, I can't come back until these things have happened. These things must happen. They are the Father's command. So we have that assurance that in the middle of it, that even though it's a bad day, the experience is not fun, when we understand this is God in charge, causing what he said at the beginning to unfold, 
our confidence that our God is still 100% in sovereign control and that Satan is just his agent to carry out this process which is to separate his own out from those who are not going to be saved. Whose decision is it whether you are saved or not when this happens? This is really important. The love of most will go cold. Whose decision was that? The person whose love went cold. God is not killing them off. God is putting them to the test to force them to make a decision, a free will decision. Will you stay faithful? Or when you're not getting your way and when it's not heaven on earth and when you're not able to walk around like a little chunk of God like those people do, do you really love me or do you only, were you only in church because the, you thought that would give you power and wealth and fame and whatever? And then when you don't have it, now you're leaving? God's not driving them away, they're leaving. Remember what we always say, so once saved, always saved is a lie, but it's never God that does the divorcing. If you lose your relationship with God, it's you that left. He will never be the one to leave. That's what this process is about. It's about making people decide. I, especially those who are teetering on the edge, who are lukewarm. You can't be lukewarm in this kind of situation. You will either decide to be very hot, you know, persevere, dig in and go down the narrow way, regardless, come or may. You'll either respond that way or you'll just go calm and go too hard in any way, I don't really care. And the scripture tells us that that's the choice most people in the church will make. Most people will abandon him. Is there a precedent for that? It's not in the notes, but is there a precedent for that in the gospel? In the early part, when he's going around and he's feeding the thousands with a, you know, a couple of fish and a few loaves, how many could he feed? Thousands, right? So it's miracle a day, raising the dead, healing the sick. It's all fantastic, right? Well, great. But then it got hard. What happened to the numbers of his disciples at the end? So during the early part, there's hundreds of people following him around. How do you know? Well, he fed thousands. They didn't turn up with a, to a lunch invitation. They were already there listening, remember? Thousands. How many are there at the crucifixion? Eleven. Not counting the woman, so eleven for sure. You know, so let's say it's down to some hundreds. Where'd the rest go? That's the precedent. It's the same thing. When it gets real, when it gets real, the lukewarm ones vanish. That's what this is talking about. But he's saying to us, I'm telling you now, so that when it happens, you won't be shaken. You won't think something's going wrong. You'll understand this is the Father's will being fulfilled. It should increase your faith, not destroy it. And we know that everything God has said has to be done. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not human, or God is not like a man, that he should lie and not like a man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. So whatever God speaks must come to pass. He's sovereign. Sovereign. Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. If you read the Old Testament prophets, you understand all the stuff Jesus is talking about was already spoken by the prophets. All the end time stuff is already in the prophets. So that's why Jesus says these things must happen. 
because God the Father already spoke them through the Old Testament prophets. There is no avoiding it. Is there a consequence of that for your prayers now? Like, is anyone concerned that wars are increasing? That, is anyone concerned about all this ethnic division? Is anyone concerned about all those things for your kids and everything? You should be, right? Except, it's probably no point asking God to stop it. What should you pray then? By the end of this, you'll know. But think about that question. Because if these things have to happen and can't be stopped because they have to happen, then there's no point asking God to stop what he has said has to happen because he won't stop it. It has to happen. Let's, by the end of this, we'll know the kind of prayers we should be praying. Remember what I said about humans mainly fall apart when things happen they're not expecting. Or, and so because they weren't expecting them, they're not prepared for them. Jesus warns us in advance about that and in verse 6 of our scripture where he's talked about wars and things he says see that you are not frightened for these things must take place but that is not yet the end not the end what does he say see to it that you are not frightened how can you not be frightened what are you going to tell yourself about what's happening to stop being frightened what is fear mostly driven by what is the biggest driver of fear not knowing what's coming ah not knowing what's coming uncertainty lack of certainty lack of control you know like if you're in a typhoon at home and it's really, really bad, and you can hear the roof creaking, and you're looking, wondering if the roof is going to stay on. Are you going to be calm? No. But if you built that house, and you over-engineered it, and you know it would take a nuclear weapon to remove the roof, like my dad would build, are you going to be calm? Yeah, why? Because you don't have any uncertainty. You know that roof is not able to be blown off. That's what Jesus is saying here. I'm telling you these things now so that you understand they are part of God's perfect will and plan of salvation. So that when you find yourself in the midst of it, that's what you'll see. You'll see your Father's plan unfolding. So you, because you belong to him, will not be afraid. Everybody else will be freaking out. Because they won't, they won't know what's happening or how it's going to end. They will be overwhelmed with fear, but not you. Does that make sense? Can't overemphasize how much that, that aspect of why he's telling us it's about not being afraid and be able to be his witness in it and you're in the same situation as everybody else but you're not afraid why because you know what's happening you know how it's going to end so you can be his witness and love your neighbor in the middle of it and hopefully snatch back some who are about to fall you won't be able to snatch everyone back but everyone you can snatch back from going cold and falling away is another life saying. Look what he says in Luke 21, verse 28, which is Luke's version of Matthew 24. When these things begin to take place, these signs, what are we to do? Stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He doesn't say panic. He says, get up. Lift up your head. Why? Why would you lift up your head? He's coming. He's coming, right? Well, why would you lift up your head? It has a specific meaning. 
when Jesus comes again, where will he come from? The heavens will split open, the sky will split open and he will appear and the whole earth will see him, right? We are to look up because he's coming, to see him coming. Not walk around with your head hanging down. We are to have a positive expectation in the middle of disaster. Does that make sense? Anyone would think you're crazy. Why aren't you afraid? Don't you know what's happening? Oh, no, I'm not afraid because I do know what's happening. Why do you look happy? Well, because I know that this is another big step, you know, in the right direction for me leaving, getting out of this joint. Leaving this place once and for all. That's going to be your witness. Right expectation arms the real disciple with the ability to both understand God is in control over the whole thing, his word being fulfilled, and it is reason for increased faith, not failure, and hope because these things tell us that the thing we hope for most is coming closer. Coming closer. So I've said here in the red, scary or not scary, it says in verse 8, all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. They will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. So it's going to get worse and worse to the end. Though here and there, basing on the history of Israel, here and there, there can still be many revivals where God knows there are people he can still reach. So the overall trend will still be toward the end. But just as happened between the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, there were short periods of quite marked repentance and recovery here and there, which is why we don't stop evangelizing, we don't stop getting on with the business of being Christian because God has not finished saving people. Okay, so just because we see all these things happen, that is not a reason to sit down and say, oh well, no point evangelizing then, that's the end, just sit back and wait for Jesus, which most of the church is doing. Do you think they're going to get a reward in heaven for stopping doing what he left his servants in charge of? There's a specific, I haven't put in here, there's a specific teaching that Jesus says about a man that goes away for a long time and leaves his servants in charge of the house. And he's a long time coming back, right? And because he's such a long time coming back, some of the servants say, our master is never coming back. Let's just slack off. Let's just enjoy ourselves. Let's just have a party. Let's just, you know, let's go to town and just leave the house, never mind. They abandon what he left them in charge of, right? Just because he seemed like, well, what's the point? He's not here and he, who knows when he'll ever come back. But then suddenly the master comes home and this is what he finds. And what does Jesus say? says, won't that master throw them out and cut them to pieces? Saying, you know, I left you in charge and I come back and none of you are doing what I entrusted to you. That's the church now. That's the church now. So we need to be prepared to put that love our neighbour as ourselves into action, even though the big picture may well be that we're in those in that last season of humanity. It make any difference. He left us in charge of the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling sinners to God. We should be his witnesses to the last minute. It shouldn't make any difference to us being Christian what's happening around us. 
that makes sense? Remember, because it's just, with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Just use one measure, Christ-likeness. Be Christ-likeness in good times and in bad. In fact, it's more important that you be Christ-like during disaster. It's more important, isn't it? That's when your neighbour needs you to be Christ-like <coughs> more than ever. So let's make sure we really understand that. Remember, I asked him for a word in season. So, you know, I think we will find ourselves having to apply this before we know it. Why does it talk about this just being the birth pangs? You know, it says it's merely the beginning of birth pangs. What does that mean? So, should we ask the nurses? What is a birth pang supposed to mean? Labour. Labour. Yep, Nurse Sean's got it. Dr. Sean. Well known paediatrician from yeah. He's got it. Birth pangs. Romans eight verse twenty two. We won't read it out, but if you read that for yourself later, it describes how the whole earth is groaning like a pregnant woman waiting for the kingdom to come like an expected loved child. It describes humanity, it describes the church as like a pregnant woman in labour. And the experience is not fun. Was it fun, Mona? No. <laughs> Isn't it funny though how much unfun it is and then woman can't wait to do it again? <laughs> Serious question though, why? Why can't you wait to do it again? And I'll tell you the answer. It's scriptural. It's what Romans 8 talks about. It says, even though the birth pains can be like mind-splittingly terrible, the second the baby is born, what happens to your thinking? You forget the pain. All you can think about is this miracle, this new birth, right? Is that right, Jackers? And it's the memory of that that allows you to know what's going to be again, but you don't care. Because you know what's going to come at the end, right? So you have an advantage over us guys in understanding tonight's topic. Because you have an understanding that, that teaches you all about how to be a Christian in the last days. Because the birth pains is the tribulation. You know? So you can't avoid it. There's no birth without them. Right? So the kingdom can't come without the tribulation. God uses a birth as a model. You know, like a picture of what happens at the end. For the kingdom to be revealed, born. For Jesus to come and, and eternity and peace and joy to be born. It's just like we are waiting for this long-awaited and desired child to be born. But meanwhile, there's this painful last-minute process. So you've been pregnant for nine months, but then suddenly the last few days... It just goes nuts, right? That's human history. So Christianity has been expecting the return of Jesus and expecting the kingdom for our equivalent of the nine months. But then at the last, in the last moment, it's like the labor pains. What, do you, what can you say about the pattern of labor pains? that tells us why God, something else about these signs. The wars, the famines, those physical things, right? He says this is just the beginning of the labour pains. So when labour pains first begin, how intense are they? Mild. Mild. And how close together are they? Wide. So you'll have like going back to the end of days, you'll have <coughs> disaster, but not 
the whole world. Bit of a break. And there's another disaster. The whole world. But the closer you come to the child being born, what happens? Two things happen. The actual pain goes up and the frequency or the or better put the gap between the intense pain gets less. Right? So it happens more often and more intensely. That's what happens with the signs. That's what happens with the tribulation in the last portion that you and I are concerned about. It's three and a half years long. 42 months. Right? Three and a half years long. But that's how it goes. So the wars and everything that people were looking at now, thinking, oh, this is it, this is it. It's only the beginning. And it's like those very early labor pains. It tells you the baby's coming, tells you the kingdom's coming. But the real enduring is yet to come. But you know it's coming. So what you do? Be prepared. Brace yourself. Especially if it's like your second child, it's easier. They say it's easier the second time. Why? You know what to expect. Right? So, it is with us. We haven't we haven't experienced the second coming before, but he's told us in advance. So as near as he can, he's prepared us so that we are not shocked or overtaken when these things happen. So the, the kind of things that we associate with the tribulation start happening closer together and they get more and more and more intense. It says that the wicked will deliver us to tribulation. So the word there is thalipsis. So thanks to Hollywood, people totally don't understand what tribulation is. And people have these huge arguments over whether we will be here for the tribulation. Let me tell you categorically that you will be here. If you're alive at that time and a Christian, you will be here for the tribulation. Right? And people say, but, but, but what about the rapture? You have to understand that the language changes after the first three and a half years from Thalipsis, tribulation, to orge, wrath. And the change isn't just in the word. The wicked people hand the Christians over to be troubled, tribulation. It means troubled. Who troubles you? What is the source of the trouble? This is really important. Antichrist and his followers. So all your trouble will be in the world, from the world. Down here. So Satan, Antichrist and his followers are the ones that will trouble you. The whole world will hate you. That's what that means. All nations will hate you. Now, I've met people that can't understand why someone in Korea would hate me and why someone in Liechtenstein would have a picture of me on their wall throwing darts at it. They think that's what all nations mean. It's a biblical term. It's, that's not what's happening. Who are the nations, biblically? In Hebrew, it's the goyim. If you are a non-Jew, you're a goy. The goyim, the nations, means everyone outside of the covenant. Everyone who is not Israel. So you and I are grafted into Israel. From God's perspective, we are part of spiritual Israel, meaning simply, in the covenant, his people. All nations hating you just means those, everyone who's not in the covenant will hate you. Why? Well, because you're not afraid. Because you stand for something they don't want to stand for. You're already seeing it now. You know, like with the gender identity thing. If you dare to say there's only two genders, what kind of response do you get now? They want to kill you. In some places, they even try and kill you. Just for stating a scientific fact. 
the actual meaning of the words is just that. So it's nothing about someone on the far side of the world and you know Bulgaria or something coming. It's about those who are outside the covenant, those who are not Israel. All nations, in other words, everyone who's outside of the covenant, will have an active hatred toward you. Why do you, what do you think that hatred will, what will drive it? What Satan's core character trait? Starts with P. Pride. And pride, is it other-centered or self-centered? Self. So Antichrist followers will be like him. So what they promote, what they boast of, and what they want their world to be like, they will expect you to conform to them, their pride, their arrogance, their selfish agenda will not be able to deal with you saying, no, not me, not joining, not agreeing, not going along, you know? And you might not, I might not be able to get you to follow Christ, but you sure as heck are not going to get me to follow Antichrist. Their pride, their arrogance, and their self-centeredness will not be able to allow you to get away with that. In exactly the same way as you see that, like those gender bender protesters, can't tolerate anyone who, even someone who's not bothering them, they just can't stand the idea that there's someone that doesn't agree with them that isn't going along, right? So you're seeing this phenomenon already. That's what he's talking about. So we just have to put up with that. How do you put up with it? You have to decide who is it that you serve. Who's, whose approval do you want? Do you want to be approved by other humans or by God? It's real simple. So if you want God's approval, it means you will have their disapproval. Okay? And some of them, in some places, will go to the point that you might be physically killed. So already in the world, anyone care to guess how many martyrs there are on average Christian martyrs a year in the world at the moment? 10? 20? Try close to 300,000 a year. Already. So it's already 300,000 odd of your brothers and sisters lose their life on account of their faith in the face of some psycho foaming at the mouth servant of Antichrist that can't tolerate the fact that you won't give up Jesus to be like them. So some will die. Does that bother you? What does Jesus say about that? Something to do with fearing God. It's not any notes, but I probably should have put it. He says, do not fear those who can kill you but then nothing else the most they can do is kill your biological body they can't kill your spirit you're eternal right so the most they can do is kill your spiritual body but then that's all they can do he says fear God who can not only kill your body but your soul as well in the lake of fire right who are you going to honour who are you going to be scared of you know, to save your this lousy tent, I can't wait to get out of this tent. Once you're 60, you'll understand. <laughs> this tent's beyond repair, right? They don't even have parts in it. <laughs> so I can't wait to get out of this tent. You know, if I ever got, like, really sick and they said, oh, sorry, you're going to die, you'd be like, yes. You know, going home. Really, I'm not kidding. But that's how it should be our attitude. And as I put in the notes, if you are killed for your faith, guess what that means for you? Early exit from the tribulation. The tribulation is over for you. The next thing you know, you are face to face with Jesus. 
right? And in Revelation it says that there's a special place for those who lose their life, who are martyred for Christ. That there's a special place in the kingdom. They are honoured by God for their faithfulness. So never be afraid of, you know, some psycho, you know, sticks a knife in you and you die because you're a Christian. You might be sorry for those who are left behind, but don't be sorry for yourself. Everyone, all the real Christians will be jealous. You know? Because you went home early. You could, you're out of the tribulation. I'm not saying run around looking to get killed, but if that happens, this is the attitude that you need. Why? Because it's the truth. The truth sets you free from fear. Knowing what to expect sets you free from being afraid of it. Does that make sense? I think I told you about that Salvation Army chaplain in World War II. He's a bit lazy physically. He's a chaplain, right? And he used to go forward with the troops in the desert. And he would um, help the stretcher bearers and the medics. But because he was lazy, he didn't like running. And when he saw other people like running and bobbing and weaving, you know, when there's bullets and shells coming, people would be like diving for cover and running and zigzagging. He used to just walk, bolt upright. He used to just walk in a straight line towards the wounded. And they'd be yelling at him, Padre, Padre, get down. And he never did. And they'd ask him, didn't you hear us yelling at you? He says, yes, yes, yes. He says, but I can't die. Only this tent. And he says, I won't die a minute early or a minute late. And he says, how do I know which, if I can't see the bullet coming, how do I know that if I zigzag that I'm not going to walk, run into it? You know? So, this is walk. Well, he never got a scratch the entire war. And he boosted the morale of all the Allied troops because if the Padre can get up and stroll out into the middle of the battle like he's on the golf course. Then all the brave soldiers with their guns could hardly stay hiding in the trenches, right? And they used to say, we can't be outdone by the Padre, so they'd get up and attack and win the battle. But the point is, he totally understood that he wouldn't die a minute earlier or a minute late. God appoints a number of days to each man. All of them are in his hands. Right, and even if even if he got hit and died, it's meant going home. You know, this is only the wilderness, right? Let's look what's next. Over many will fall away and hate one another. So we've covered that. But again, when you see lots and lots of people giving up their faith, don't be rattled. It's God's word being fulfilled. Verse 11. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world as testimony to all nations, and only then will the end come. Now, Remember how we talked about the physical things, you know, wars and earthquakes and famines? Jesus, for every time Jesus mentions one of that sort of thing, three times as often he talks about signs in the church, including these. False teachers, false prophets, false signs and wonders. Rebellion against the word. The people no longer, as Paul tells Timothy, a time will come when they will no longer put up a sound doctrine, but will get for themselves teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. It's all through the gospel. The biggest sign is the church. The most important sign of the end is not what happens in the world. Jesus mentions that one time for every three times that he mentions something in the church. It's the signs in the church that are the most important. Unfortunately, all the things he warns of are happening big time. 
So at the end, more and more and more false teachers arise. More cults, more people that claim to be Jesus. At least, as we sit here right now, there's at least five people I know of who've literally claimed to be Jesus. And if they were on the psych unit, that would be one thing, but they're not. They all have churches. Right? And followers. Jesus said that the wicked will go will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Right? This problem in the church will just get worse and worse and worse. The Antichrist spirit at work is grooming them that don't love the truth. It's grooming them to accept Antichrist. When Antichrist appears, they will be his number one fans. Because to them, he will fit the model of what it's grooming them to expect Jesus to be like. He'll give them power. He'll give them wealth and health and a kind of global peace. For the first three and a half years when we're being troubled, Antichrist will achieve a fake global peace, especially in the Middle East. And then he, halfway through the last seven years, he breaks the covenant, he breaks that peace treaty and turns on Israel. That's what, that's what triggers the rapture. That's what has the church gone. And from that moment on, it's all about the Jews and Israel for God because the Christians are out. So at the end of tribulation, the rapture takes us away. That's why the word changes from tribulation to wrath. Because the source of the wrath, Hollywood would have you believe that it's the devil pouring out his anger on the humans. That's scripturally backwards. It's the wrath of who falling on the humans that were not raptured. God. It's the beginning of final judgment, which is why the Christians are not there. We are not appointed to wrath. We will be here to be troubled. But at the point that it switches from the, being the world troubling us to God troubling the world, more than troubling, of course he has to remove us out of the way. We can't be here when he pours out the punishment on the wicked. And that punishment on the wicked will kill two-thirds of the Jewish people that are left and it's the one-third that finally repent. So he'll destroy, virtually destroy the whole earth to get that one-third to repent. The whole last three and a half years is to get that one-third of the most stubborn people on earth to repent. Why? To keep a promise to the patriarch such as his faithfulness to his promises. When he promises, he does. But we won't be here for that. So we're only concerned up to the end of tribulation. That's the end of, that's the, end of the part that concerns us. But we can tick this box, alas. The false prophets, the cults, the false teachers, so many. Now, halfway down, almost the end of page 4. We need to read from Revelation 13. Remember what I said about if you're in one, a misfortune to be in a dominionist or NAR style church where you think the kingdom's already here so that I should have all this authority from God to command anything in the name of Jesus and demons have to run and you know, so I can force heaven on earth by praying it into being or whatever, right? Look what Revelation 13 says actually happens. The beast, so that's um, Antichrist, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opens its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Then verse 7, which affects us. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, 
all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So if your name is in the Book of Life, you're not included. This calls for what? Patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. God's people are still here. If he's allowed to wage war on us and overcome us, what does that mean? It's what Jesus says, work while you have the light, because the time will come when you'll not be able to work, because the spirit will be withdrawn. We won't have any power to go forward. We'll be in the armour of God, standing in faith three and a half years. All we'll be able to do is endure patiently. Patient. I'm saying that twice for my own ears. Because I thought patients were only for hospitals. But not for me. But actually I need to learn patience. Very no longer very patient person. So patient, endurance, perseverance, it's just three and a half years. About the same as COVID. We all got through COVID, right? What did we have to do? Patiently endure it. Good practice. Because we won't be able to overcome Antichrist. The church will have no authority because Antichrist is the one that has the authority at this time. See what it says there? He is given power. By, from whom? God. God gives him power to wage war. Patient endurance and what? Faithfulness. So again, if your expectations are like most of the church and you think that we're just going to chase Satan away in the name of Jesus and all this, bring heaven on earth, but then this happens, what God says will actually happen, your faith could be shredded, right? But this doesn't destroy us. What does it say? It only, he only gets to destroy those whose names are not in the book of life who are not in the covenant, who are not Christians. The Christians can't beat him, but he can't beat them either. It calls for patient endurance. At the end of the three and a half years, rapture, bang, gone. Patient endurance. Now, all these things have to happen have a right expectation, you will not be overcome. Bottom of page four, we have to have a second set of right expectations. What should I expect of myself if I'm really born again? So let's just go to cuckoo land for a second and think about what a lot of so-called born again Christians people in those NAR-style churches or Dominionist-style churches, when they say, oh, I'm born again, what are, they, what are they assuming about themselves? Never mind whether it's biblical or not. Just generally, what's their attitude? Are they usually very humble? Why aren't they very humble? What is it that they believe about themselves because they're born again? They're saved, period. So there's nothing, they've got no developing to do, right? They're, like they're a finished product. Saved. And they have the Holy Spirit, right? Meaning they have authority. And it's God's authority, and therefore it's be Satan running away from them, not the other way around. And that they can just command anything in his name, and he has to do it as if Jesus was the household butler. You know? all totally unbiblical. So part of us enduring, part of you being able to love yourself, accept yourself as a Christian, and be a good witness is, you need right expectation, not of that cuckoo stuff, but what does being filled with the Holy Spirit actually bring? What does someone who's really born again, really filled with the Holy Spirit, look like? And I'll tell you for free, it's nothing like you think. 
and it's sure nothing like those churches think. And we find out what it is in Galatians 5, bottom of page 4, almost done. So if you're at home, Galatians 5, verse 19. So obviously we don't want to be in the flesh, right? So we're starting here. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. Look at all the scandals in the mega churches at the moment. They're all tick, 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 right? The amount of sexual immorality and debauchery, God knows what else is going on. That's God is exposing. Every day I get another email about another mega church going from this. Was the Holy Spirit in those churches? No. These are the acts of the flesh, not the Holy Spirit. They claim to be spirit filled. They're they're filled with the Spirit, all right, but it isn't God. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, that's the biggie, dissensions, factions, (coughs) envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. So leave you to imagine what all those are like. Please don't experience it. Leave that to someone else. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You get that? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why I'm so concerned. That's why I go on and on about it, because I want them to be saved, and if they don't repent, they won't be. Now the bit that concerns us. But the fruit of the Spirit... So when we talk about the fruit, what do we mean? If Alec claims to be a lemon tree, I'll be surprised. But if she did, what should I expect? Lemons. The fruit of being a the fruit of being a lemon tree is lemons. The fruit of being a spirit-filled Christian is what? So it's what is the equivalent of lemons tell you that it's a lemon tree. What is it tells you that this is actually Holy Spirit filled disciple. Let's look. The fruit of the Spirit is love, specifically agape. Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and biggie, self control. Self control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Holy Spirit, capital S, and it's Holy Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So all those words in English, you can assume what they mean, but in some of them you won't be right. So for tonight's last bit of tonight's lesson is simply to look at what the actual Greek words mean that are the fruit. This is what a real, full-on, full-blown, spirit-filled, born-again, holy roller Christian (coughs) should have. Let's look. Love. So this is agape specifically, meaning the exercise of rational, with your head, free will to act and to relate in reflection of Jesus to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. It's got nothing to do with feelings. Nothing. It's a, it's a freedom given by the power of God in you to make godly choices about everything, including how you relate to other people. To reflect Him. Joy, people assume, has got something to do with happiness. Because in English, it does. But this is not English. This is Greek. So when you read joy, you assume that, oh, well, I should be happy all the time. No. The word here is kara, and it's related to that word you already know, charis, which is grace. And what kara is, is such a strong awareness of God's presence and favour toward you that you can endure anything because of his presence with you. Remember he says, peace I give you, but not as the world gives it? 
meaning he, he gives you the peace he gives you isn't an absence of an absence of conflict it's a peace in the middle of conflict this is the same the word translated as joy kara means a knowledge of his presence with you and his favor towards you that gives you so much confidence that you know that you will be safe in the midst of trouble in the midst of distress because he is with you in it. Even if your emotion is sadness, you can have kara, joy. Joy has nothing to do with happiness. Peace. Irene. So Irene in Greek is the closest you can come to shalom in Hebrew. And we greet each other, shalom, right, meaning, you know, like, peace be with you. So in the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, they used to say that all the time, peace be with you, right? That's a rough translation of shalom, right? But actually in Hebrew, shalom doesn't mean what it sounds like in English. When I wish you shalom, what am I wishing you? What is that peace, though? Because that's the meaning of Irene. I'm actually meaning you wholeness. You are broken. You are fallen short of Christ. You are being transformed, but you are not yet perfect who you will be in the kingdom. Shalom is me wishing you completeness. When I say shalom, I mean peace with God. Perfect peace by you being perfected. I am wishing you the the satisfaction in full of the sanctification process. That the process you're in with God should find its complete fulfillment so that you would have complete peace with God. So I'm not wishing you an absence of trouble. Although I can, I can wish you that. I'm wishing you something far more important. That you would be made whole that your relationship with God will be fully restored so that you can see him face to face and hear well done good and faithful servant enter in so when I say shalom to you that's what actually in the Hebrew meaning that's what I'm wishing and praying upon you right Irene is the Greek word closest to that meaning and because the gospel is in Greek that's the word they use but if it was in Hebrew, it would be Shalom. Right? So, it's, when it, so the fruit, which is peace, has nothing to do with an absence of trouble. It's not that kind of peace. It's a knowledge that I'm going to be made whole. That I'm already not who I used to be, and I... And tomorrow I'll be even less like who I used to be. And in the end, I'll be completely new when Jesus presents me without blemish and without spot as part of the bride before his father. The knowledge of that by the Spirit in you allows you to endure this world, knowing that you're leaving it day by day. And the things you hated about yourself are fading away as he transforms you. As you, as you are ever more pleasing to God, as your faithfulness bears fruit in you, a transformed soul, Irene, right? But the very important thing is, it doesn't require that you are, have situational peace, you know, an absence of conflict. You can have Irene and Shalom in the middle of a war, you know, with people shooting at you. Forbearance. Sometimes um, translated as patience. So this means being like God, slow to anger, quick to forgive, willing to bear other people's imperfections patiently. Understanding that just like you need time, they need time. You don't have a different expectation of others than you want for yourself. 
Is anyone able to like be completely sanctified by tomorrow? Please put your hand up. No, right? So if you can't do it, neither can your neighbour. Forbearance or patience. Kindness. So this is a really, uh, Christote, it's a really unusual word. And it's to do with action. So if, if I say that Marivik is a kind person, and she is a kind person, in case you're wondering, what do I mean? In English, first. Usually, you'll think something like nice, um, thoughtful. Okay, now you're getting closer to the Greek meaning. The, what, the difference between the English and the Greek is, is the Greek is very, very specific. It's about action. So this word that we translate as kindness, in English, kindness can just be about an attitude, right? Or, a, yeah, like a personality trait and attitude. But this Greek word is more than that. This Greek word requires action. So this Greek word means this is someone who, who acts kindly, who seeks to help in a literal and meaningful way. You know, they get up out of their chair and they do. So they're not just empathetic. They're not just sympathetic. You know, they don't just have kind thoughts. Mm -hmm. They have the actions that follow from kind thoughts. So this, the, so the presence of the Holy Spirit in you should result in more than just sympathy for people. You, it should so your sympathy or empathy should so unsettle you that you can't stay in your chair. You might not be able to solve something, but what, what's within your power to do, you want to do, and you get up and you do it. You know, it might just be a drop in the bucket, but it's a drop that wasn't there before. You know, and you never know from small things, great things grow. Goodness. This word, agathosune, is very, very important. Because this word, doesn't mean what the world calls good. This is a Greek philosophic term for absolute good. So what is absolute good for us? Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness is the definition of absolute good. So you can substitute Christ-likeness for this word. You should have absolute goodness as a result, in the spirit of him who is absolutely good in you. Which means it's, you, you won't be perfect, but the influence of the spirit in you is to have you respond to live and to design toward yourself and others that which is absolutely good. <clears throat> we don't think of it that way. We think of it as, I desire Jokus to be absolutely Christ-like because of what that will mean for her in the <coughs> kingdom of God. The Greek puts it that I desire absolute good to her. That's the spirit in me, and I, and I live and do in reflection of that influence in me. Does that make sense? Next one, faithfulness. You know this one really well, pistis, right? So not just faith, to believe what's right, Pistis, to act on that right belief, action. So goodness and faithfulness are really closely related. Last one, gentleness. Now this is a really interesting one because this word here, um, prote, has the same root as another word that we've talked about before, preote. They sound almost the same. This one is translated gentleness, the other is translated meekness. And we did this when we did the Beatitudes, to know how good your memory is. So what can we say about the meek? Blessed are the meek. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? 
But what did we discover about this word meek? Because in English, people think meek means something that rhymes with it. Weak. People assume that if you're meek, that you're powerless. That's not what this word means. And this gentleness, because it shares the same root, it actually shares this special quality that meekness has, applies to this word gentleness as well. If I am gentle, this kind of gentleness, there's two kinds of people can be gentle. People who don't have any choice because they're weak. They don't have the option of being a bully because they are, you know, 50 kilos of no muscle. So they will be gentle and quiet and retiring because they're afraid. Oh, they never, they, so they just go around very quietly out of fear. There's another kind of gentle person. Who's that? God, that's got the ability to react but chooses not to. That's it. That's the six foot nine bodybuilder that could rip you into small pieces. But he doesn't, because the spirit of God in him means he, that he never uses the strength and power that he has for his own means. Gentleness, the meaning of gentleness here is about a decision to not misuse strength, to act gently. And you all understand that if you have kids. Because you are immensely strong compared to even Elliot, muscle woman, is immensely strong compared to Seth, right? Mm -hmm. So you are, aren't you conscious every time you pick him up? That you need to pick him up in a way that won't break him because even mm -hmm. you have enough strength to break his arms and legs? Mm -hmm. That's what this is. Mm -hmm. So the spirit in us, the real manifestation of that, is that we are actually, actually in Christ, we are immensely strong. We are strong in character, we are strong in ability, and whenever God desires it, he can anoint us to be actually supernaturally invincible. For instance, if he needs to drive a demon out of something, he can choose any of you to do that. Right? We are far from weak. But we must be gentle. Gentle is a choice. And the influence of that choice is because of the Spirit in us. Which is why real Christians are never arrogant and proud and noisy and pushy and demanding. Because that's not this. No matter how big and strong you are. In fact, the bigger and the stronger, the richer, the more influential, the more famous, or whatever, the more you have to be sure that you're doing this. Okay. This is what a real born again person looks like. What do these qualities give you? If you look at them closely, because I'm going to finish the episode over the time, when you look at these things closely, you will see that all of these qualities allow you to stand in the midst of situational chaos. Jesus puts us as his voice in the middle of chaos. It's not that there won't be storms in your life, but it's the confidence that even though your boat's in a terrible storm, Jesus is in your boat. And because he's in your boat, your boat's going to arrive safely. These things allow us to be in the storm that is the tribulation. They allow us to be in the storm that is even in just the world as it already is, even, you know? This is what a real born-again Christian looks like. This is the real fruit of the Spirit. These qualities. No shiny suits. No 
naming and claiming and shouting at tables. You know? Does this make any sense? Mm -hmm. So that you should desire these things. So if you are praying for your own sanctification, look this up, get to know this. Ask God to manifest these things in you more and more. This is because this is the real fruit. You know? Because if Alec could actually grow a lemon out of her ear, we could agree that she's a lemon tree, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to tell me you're a real born again Christian, this is what we should find. And if we don't find it, well, you don't find it in yourself, at least not to the degree you want, this is what you should seek God for. Remember what, um, what I said at the beginning? What should you pray since there's no point asking him to stop what he says must happen? What should we be praying for then? We should be praying to be really born again, really spirit-filled, really anointed, to be his, able to stand unafraid as his witnesses when those things that have to happen, happen. So that not only for our own sake, but so that we're able to strengthen our neighbour. Firstly, your immediate neighbour, your fellow Christians, but then also those who we still have to care about, and we ought to care about, who don't know any of this because they've been in some church that tells them that, you know, you're a little god and you can name and claim anything and it's all going to be heaven on earth any second, and, you know? And who won't know what to think or do when it doesn't turn out that way, when it turns out instead to be what God said, not what their loopy pastor said. So we're finishing now with Second Peter 1. So it's on your last page, just that last paragraph. Just read through with them. How about we read it out together? Let's all read it out together. And that's our, I'll see it at the bottom, I'll see it, this is your homework. Okay? So I want you to know Second Peter 1 is your homework. Let's read together. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason we make every effort, make every effort, there's the homework part, to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is near-sighted and blind, forgetting they have been cleansed from their past sins. Make every effort to add these things. So you know what to pray for, and you know what to practice in order to take it from a theory to knowledge, and from knowledge to action, and from action to transformation because this is God's will by his word. So you can be sure that the spirit will more than cooperate. The spirit is always waiting for us to come this way to follow. That is the end, 7.30, ooh, not bad. This is the end for this week. And uh, when is it, who's doing it next week? Must be almost time for, is it too early for <laughs> oh, okay, so it looks like it's me again next week. <laughs> soon, soon it will be the next generation. It might even be the, is it the aunties? Maybe next week is the aunties. Let's see. Uh, we'll leave that for them to work out. Anyhow, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for your word. We thank you for warning us in advance of everything that will actually happen. 
as opposed to what the church wishfully thinks would happen. We pray and thank you, Lord, that your sacrifice given once for all redeems us from all sin and that you have set us aside for yourself so that even though we find ourselves in the midst of trouble, in the boat in a storm, you are in the boat with us. Even in the tribulation, there you are in us and with us. Nevertheless, Lord, we pray for the fruit of the Spirit to be manifest in us more and more every day. Help us, Lord, to encourage each other. Answer our prayers for it, Lord, and be jealous for your shame, your name, in us, among us, and concerning us so that we could be fruitful branches, that we could see people actually saved and not merely have their ears tickled. We pray, Lord, that you pour out your spirit in the conviction of the truth to rescue as many as can still be rescued, no matter what lie they're caught up in in this very moment. We pray these things for your sake, Lord Jesus, since you did not turn back from the cross and you suffered and you wept and you bled. So why, Lord, should you be denied even one of these that you laid your life down for saying. With all this in mind, Lord, we go ahead into the week and we trust that you'll be with us and lead us and you'll bring us even further, Lord, into the whole truth, into the goodness of God, into full and fruitful lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's it for tonight. Shalom. See you next time.